Okay, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us for the Chow Chak Wing Museum's latest instalment in our digital program for the Sydney lockdown period. Um, it is my privilege to uh, introduce our presenters uh, this evening and to welcome you all. My name is Craig Barker. I am the head of public engagement for the Chow Chak Wing Museum, and it's lovely to have you join us. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that uh, 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 that we are, those of us in Australia, I know we have many international guests, but those of us in Australia are, of course, on countries of the various First Nations peoples. Um, I'm personally coming to you from Gadigal and Wangwa land here in Sydney. I know that many of you have coming joining Um, you are most welcome in the already have, but I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional owners of uh, the lands in which we come and from we meet. Uh, for our international guests, this is, uh, this is a common Australian uh, acknowledgement of the country of the First Nations people, and also acknowledgement not just of the care for the land the First Nations people have had for generations and continue to do so, but also to acknowledge that the land was never ceded. This evening's event is one that we've been very excited about. We've been planning for, for quite some time, well before lockdown. And so it's been an interesting experiment for us to transition what was going to be a face-to-face -face event to a digital one. Um, tonight's presentation is uh, also, uh, I'm very pleased and honoured to say, a co-hosted event with the Sydney chapter of AWAS, the uh, Austra Australasian Women of Ancient World Studies group. And so it's welcome. Uh, it's, it's great welcome to our friends from AWAS joining us tonight as well. Uh, in the chat function, we have placed a document um, called a bibliography uh, that our presenters have put together. This includes the cast of characters that they're going to be discussing in the podcast and also some further reading if anyone's keen to do. So I would suggest opening that Word document if you can to follow along, or of course, saving it to review after the, uh, after the, uh, the presentation has taken forward or, or, or taken place, I should say. Um, is, as we go along to this evening, if anyone has any problems, just add something into the chat function. We'll also invite you, uh, you know, if you have any questions for our, our presenters tonight, to add uh, those questions into the Q&A and our moderator will review those questions at the very end. We're quite excited that both of our guests have um, agreed to do a Q&A session afterwards. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, well, I know uh, I've, I've had the privilege of, of seeing what they're going to be discussing today. Um, I know that a lot of questions will come up. So feel free to place any questions into the Q&A function as we go along. We also have auto captioning uh, available for tonight's talk as well, if anyone does need to access that. But what is interesting is, uh, is uh, here, I'm just going to go and try and reload that document too, just by the way, just to make sure that everyone can actually access it. Okay, so that should be coming through now. Uh, but just to, yeah, to also say that we've got auto captioning um, function available if anyone requires it. As always with the Zoom auto captioning, um, any terminology in Latin and some of the names are not going to come across as they're actually pronounced tonight. Um, so having that bibliography should actually be able to assist. If for any reason people can't access the bibliography this evening, um, feel free to contact us at the Chow Chak Wing Museum and I'm more than happy to email it to you separately and individually. But to begin. Uh, it's a real, real honour to introduce our guest presenters this evening. Dr Fiona Radford completed her PhD in Ancient History at Macquarie University in 2012. She's an expert on Rome and depictions of ancient Rome in film, uh, particularly Stanley Kubrick and Kirk Douglas's 1960 masterpiece, masterpiece Spartacus, one of my personal favourite films. Um, but she's published widely on the subjects, uh, and, and particularly on Spartacus, uh, in a number of places, including the Wiley Blackwell Companion to Ancient Greece and Rome on film. 
Her most recent work is a commentary on the script for The Gladiators, uh, a movie of the 1950s. Dr. Peter Greenfield has a PhD from the University of Sydney, um, likewise completing in 2012, and is an expert on Rome's Vestal Virgins. Her research primarily focuses on the intersection of the social, political, and religious aspects of late Republican and into the early Principate of Rome. And much of her more recent work is writing for bad ancient, interrogating common claims about the ancient world. Since uh, 2013, Fiona and Peter, or Dr. Rad and Dr. G, as fans of us and listeners will know them, have been broadcasting episodes of the podcast, The Partial Historians, to thousands internationally. Um, and I, I've just, I must say just how much I admire what they've been able to achieve in the podcast. The podcast was apparently born from late night conversations between Dr. G and Dr. Rad about their passion for teaching and of course their, their shared excitement for Roman history and finding ways to engage with a wider audience. Um, and passions, I should also mention in passing, of course, your passion for costume wearing <laughs> as well. Um, but uh, uh, the partial historians aptly lives up to their tagline of one ancient Roman podcast, two historians view on the ancient world. In the eight years that the Partial Historian podcast has been in operation, Peter and Fiona have taken listeners on to journeys across a myriad aspects of ancient Roman culture and life. Topics explored include Augustus, Livia, the Vestal Virgins, Roman popular culture, Pompeii, women in the ancient world, and the foundations of Rome in a humorous, fun, and educational experience. Now, uh, I should also mention that uh, uh, the two of them are currently working on a book. I believe it's all top secret, hush, hush, so stay tuned. That is very, very exciting to see um, um, what you will be producing in the near future as well. Of course, the podcast, for those of you who have not had the privilege of listening, is available on uh, your favourite podcast platforms, and you can learn more about The Partial Historians and access past episodes through their website, www.partialhistorians.com, including the opportunity to also support Peter and Fiona in their work. So tonight, Dr. Fiona Radford, Dr. Peter Greenfield will present a special episode of The Partial Historians titled, Why Yes, I Did Murder the King, The Women of Early Rome. Welcome to this special episode of The Partial Historians. I am Dr. Rad. And I am Dr. G, and we are super excited to be talking about the women of early Rome. Indeed we are. Now, when you think about Roman history, Dr. G, I think the periods that have probably got the most attention in popular culture over time have been the late Republic and the early Principate. And what's that to love? It's got political intrigue, dynamic personalities, absolute power, even a sprinkle of incest sometimes. Hmm. Game of Thrones wishes it was ancient Rome in this time period. It's got all the drama. <laughs> the Julio Claudians, Rome's first imperial dynasty, are a particular source of endless fascination for scholars and amateur enthusiasts alike. And one of the reasons why you and I were first attracted to these periods when we first started our careers was the prominence of women. As Rome progressed towards this system where you had one man dominating the governance governance of Rome, and you had this eventual establishment of a dynasty, female relatives acquired a new significance, and they start to appear in the sources more frequently. Yes, but somehow, even though our first love seems to be the late Republic and that early Principate lead into the Imperial period, we've actually been talking about early Rome for years now. <laughs> uh, since about 2014, we have been tracing the history of Rome from its traditional foundation date, 753 BCE. And this means that we've been spending a lot of time looking at the early version of Roman governments, which is the monarchical period. And there's kings and there's families. And while we don't get a traditional sense of dynasties being built necessarily, what we do see in this very early period is a lot of women which is very exciting for us. So what we see as we've moved through this early period, and we're now in the podcast, we're more into the early Republic, we've seen a real diminishment in the number of named women 
who seem to have a significant role to play in the histories that are being recorded. So there's some parallels to be made between the early kingship period of ancient Rome and the sort of more famously known late Republic, early Principate history of Rome itself. So some of what we've got to contend with here is our evidence for the period in question. There is material culture, which is very helpful in many ways, but our written sources tend to give us a very particular view of what is going on. And so one of the consequences of the source material we'll be looking at in this episode is that there is a real focus on men, mostly, uh, and this source material is written by men and generally for men. And yet you can't get away from the fact that when we're talking about a monarchy, women have a really significant role to play. And we're going to see that coming through in our source material in this episode. Absolutely. Those kings, they've got wives, they've got mothers, they've got daughters, they've got lovers, they've got, the, they've got it all. Now, the other thing we probably should flag before we dive straight in is that when we're dealing with this very early period of Roman history, it's kind of hard to distinguish sometimes between actual historical events, which we think really happened, and a sort of mythological bent <laughs> that runs through our sources. There definitely is a lot of blending going on in this time period in our sources. Uh, one of my favourite things that we came across uh, when we were first researching this period was from Gary Forsyth, who said that the counts of this period are a little bit like a Hollywood blockbuster. Expertly crafted stories, but a little bit dubious in the facts department. So that's something to keep in mind. However, we're not really going to be delving into did this really happen or didn't it, because we can certainly learn a lot about the Romans themselves, how they perceive themselves, the stories that they choose to repeat and preserve over time by looking at these tales of ladies from Roman past. Yeah, and so I think this is a really exciting point to sort of jump into our first woman, first cab off the rank, and it's even pre-Rome. We're going to be talking about Rhea Silvia, Ooh. and she is a really significant figure for ancient Rome because she is the mother of Romulus and Remus, and these are the two that are going to go on in the hyperbolic sort of foundation story of ancient Rome, the two brothers that come together to like start Rome itself. So we have to go a little bit back in time. <laughs> back in time. It's around about 772 BCE. Don't ask me how they get the dates so right. I'm guessing they've made some stuff up. Uh, but we've got a place that's just sort of south of Rome, this kingdom of Alba. And if you get the opportunity to go to Italy, I definitely recommend that you head out there. It's still there. Um, it's in the beautiful foothills just to the southeast of Rome, a gorgeous area. Um, the Pope has his summer house there. Um, <laughs> and in this area, this was a kingship that was sort of passed down sort of in the family line. It was a hereditary kingship. And the father had two sons, Amulius and Numitor. Numitor ended up being king, and Amulius ended up being insanely jealous. Amulius wasn't going to take uh, this situation laying down. Oh, no. Uh, he managed to raise up uh, a rival sort of faction against his brother, managed to depose him, and then became king himself. Yes. Now, I know. <laughs> and I imagine... I think to myself, if I was Amulius, I would have wanted to make sure that I got the job done, you know? Gotta have to kill the brother. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, that is not how Amulius rolls, apparently. Maybe Numitor has more support than it is maybe recognized generally, but he gets to live and so does his family. Mm. But Amulius does try to stitch things up so things work out in his favor. And this is where Rhea Silvia enters the story. Oh. She is the daughter of Numitor. So she is an important and significant woman in her own right. And what happens to her under Amulius's rule is that he places her in the Vestal Virgin Order. Ooh. Yeah, and this is big because one, it's, it's a cult of virginity essentially, uh, but she has to be separated from her family. It's like a prison sentence of sorts 
because the role for a daughter of a king is obviously to marry an important, significant citizen of the city and to carry on those sort of family connections and relationships. That's the patriarchal sort of way in broader ancient Italy. That's not what she gets to do. So she ends up in this order. Whether she likes it or not, it's not at all clear. But she goes along with it. It obviously saves her life to a certain extent. And it means that she's engaging in a whole bunch of sort of ritual process. And one of these things is to go out and collect water. And about sort of four years into her term as a Vestal, she's going out and she's collecting water. She sort of takes a break, sits down by the riverside. And as she's drifting off, something terrible happens. She is approached uh, by a man who may be a god. There's some, there's some questions here. Mm-hmm. And things unfold in a way that is unpleasant. Uh, and she ends up losing her virginity. She then has to turn around and go back home, go back to the order, and it's obviously a hugely traumatic event and not something that she necessarily wants to talk about. And the problem, if she does talk about it, is that Vestal virgins are punished if they lose their virginity. Obviously, virgin virgin is in the name, uh, so that part of this, <laughs> you can't get away from the fact that that's part of the thing here. Yeah. And so she does confide in her mother, though, and she's like, look, this thing has happened to me. It's terrible. I'm not a virgin anymore. What does this even mean for my position and situation? And her mother is like, don't tell anybody, okay? I'm glad you came to me, but do not tell a soul. Unfortunately, though, this moment has led to a pregnancy. Yeah. And there is only so so much time you have up your sleeve as somebody who is pregnant uh, to get away with covering that up. Generally speaking, it gets a bit tricky at some point. We know that some women do progress through their whole pregnancy and uh, it is a surprise, <laughs> but that's pretty rare. It is rare. Uh, it can happen. Um, and it's very unlikely that it's going to be the case for Rhea Sylvia in part because she's carrying twins. Well, of course. I mean, the father is a god, so you know, is a he, god. Shoots, he shoots, he scores twice. Yeah, <laughs> pew, pew. Yeah. Uh, hits the target twice. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so she's not just carrying a child, she's carrying two children. So this is a significant pregnancy, one that appears to have a sort of divine aspect to it. Um, certainly there's ancient thinking around um, the sort of connection of twins with a divine connection. Mm. That idea that this this is a very special type of pregnancy. Sure. Uh, but it is an issue, not just for her p- place in the order, but also for Amulius's plans to try and sort of curb his brother's influence in Alba. All of a sudden, uh, the daughter that's been sort of shunted off to the side is now apparently, because rumours are spreading, apparently carrying the children of God, you know, <laughs> Mars has (laughs) impregnated by Mars. It's like, what do you do? I mean, that's that's a problem. But if the gods have willed it, you really can't stop it from happening. Mm. And so Amulius thinks about this situation and decides that how he's going to proceed is he's going to put her under guard. And so in addition to the trauma that she's already experienced, she's now segregated and under guard. Uh, for the duration of her pregnancy. As soon as she gives birth, those children are taken from her by Amulius, and then he decides that he's going to get rid of those children, and he orders them to be put into the river um, with the idea that they will drown and not survive. Mm. So this is a tragic story for for Rhea Silvia. Um, This is a woman who, through no fault of her own, has gone through a whole series of traumatic experiences and has found herself on the other side of that, uh, a mother, but without her children. And part of what happens within this, and this is kind of bringing together all interweaving the different sort of source material together. There's a few different versions of what happens to her um, at this point. One of the versions is the suggestion that she ends up being imprisoned and secretly uh, and under sort of harsh circumstances, because she can no longer remain in the Vestal Order, that um, would be a problem. Covers Berlin. 
Yeah, that's a, a yes. Very severely blown, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, so she can't stay in the order. The traditional punishment for a Vestal who has lost their virginity is to be scourged with rods in this early period, according to Dionysius of Halicarnassus. And the other option is to bury them alive. So the options are not looking good. No. The fact that Amulius decides to imprison her seems to suggest or perhaps connect the pregnancy with him in mm. certain sources. Ew. There is a suggestion that it wasn't Mars, that it was Amulius um, who deliberately violated her. And this is the reason that she gets to live uh, beyond the pregnancy. There is also a story that her cousin, uh, so the daughter of Amulius, sort of intercedes on her behalf and seeks out uh, a lenient sentence for Rhea Silvia, being like, it's my cousin, it's family, is there anything that we can do? Could I trade places with her? You know, this doesn't need to happen like this. And Amulius relents and allows her to be sort of held in secret rather than killed. Yes. And the final sort of version of her story is that she escapes imprisonment and she sort of is so overcome by the the different traumas that she's undergone that she no longer wants to live. And she sort of uh, gives herself to the river in the same sort of way that she understands her children have been placed in the river. So she kind of wants to return to them and just to end her life. And it's in this moment that some of our sources suggest that the river god, Arneo, which is flowing through those hills and joins up with the Tiber, um, actually rises up and looks after her, basically encases her in water and she becomes a goddess and uh, she transforms in this moment and goes on to live with him um, in, in the, as part of the natural river system, which I think is a, a really interesting way to wrap up her story and to give her some closure perhaps on the pain that she's experienced. Yeah, it's so interesting that she doesn't have to suffer any of the traditional punishments for being a Vestal Virgin, or at least the ones that we think are traditional at this point in time. I mean, it's so early, who knows? But yes, absolutely. Well, Romulus and Remus, of course, are at the centre of that story by the end. You know, they're being left on the river back there. And so you're absolutely right in that Amulius obviously wants to get rid of these twins, particularly if they happen to be, you know, the children of, of Mars. I mean, this is, this is a dangerous thing here that has happened. And so... He sends some soldiers off with the boys probably in some sort of basket or something like that to put them in the in the Tiber, hoping that they will drown. What has happened, though, of course, is that the Tiber has actually flooded. And so what ends up happening is that once the floodwaters recede, the babies had only been sort of on the edges. And so they end up getting left on essentially dry land. And this is where a second maternal figure enters their life. Now, we don't know a lot about her, but I'm just going to quickly flag that they did have an adoptive mother of some sort. She doesn't get as much attention as their adoptive father, who's a herdsman who stumbles across the boys, supposedly while they're being suckled by a she-wolf, which is a creature associated with Mars. And he takes them home and gives them to his wife and is like, let's raise these boys, which they do. Um, we don't get a lot of detail, so I won't go into it, but her name seems to be Laurentia. There is a bit of bit of, uh, of the reports in the ancient sources that maybe she was a loose woman in her past and because of her sexual conduct previously she had been given the nickname in Latin Lupe which referred to her as like a sort of she-wolf and therefore maybe that's the origin of the story that Romulus and Remus were twins and were suckled and you know saved by a she-wolf so she is there she is obviously important but we interestingly don't get a lot of details from their childhood so we'll, we'll leave her be for the moment the person that i would like to focus on mostly if we're thinking about romulus is his wife hercilia so for those of you who don't know romulus and remus once they have found out the truth of their past they end up restoring their grandfather to his throne and defeating the evil uncle, <laughs> great uncle, and they end up going off and finding, founding their own city, which is, of course, Rome. And in the course of that, Remus is killed. There are a number of different stories about how, yeah, exactly. Alas, alas, <laughs> he is dead. Romulus, therefore, becomes the first king of Rome. Now, there's a bit of debate about when this event 
happens in his in his reign. But I am going to highlight how he met his wife, which requires a little bit of background. And it is also a very uncomfortable moment in Roman history when we look at this story. So at some stage in the first five years of Romulus's reign, it seems that he looks around, he's pretty satisfied with the fact that Rome's on the up and up. You know, it's a city on the move, it's growing, it's expanding, it's getting stronger all the time. The trouble is that when he first established Rome, he did invite people to come and have a fresh start in Rome. So he's got a bit of, bit of rabble coming to his new city to help him set it up. And they, it was basically for men. It was like a sanctuary for men. Okay, so he's mostly got men around him, seemingly. I see. A group of dudes. All right. A group of dudes, apparently. Okay. <laughs> now, it's a bit unclear about whether that is actually the case or whether they just had riff-raffy type women that they didn't want or whether Romulus was actually interested in trying to set up some alliances with some neighbouring cities now that Rome is, you know, getting a bit more established. But in some accounts, it's also the fact that they just have a total lack of women considering how many men they have. And you know what? You need women to make babies. So if you want this city to keep going, you might have to get on that. <laughs> what? Yeah. That's outrageous. <laughs> so whatever the motivation, Romulus ends up sending envoys around to a lot of like the neighboring areas and saying, hey, how's about it? <laughs> and all of them look at Rome and say, um, no, thank you. You guys are literally the worst. This looks like a frat party and I don't want to come. Yeah, exactly. You are clearly several levels beneath us in terms of your pedigree. So I uh, know, thank you. This, of course, offends the Romans, but it doesn't solve their problem of either wanting alliances or wanting women or whatever. So Romulus decides it's time for a clever plan. <laughs> <laughs> so he decides that what he's going to do, he's going to throw a big festival. Okay. And he, some accounts, he even gets the approval of the Senate to go ahead with this whole plan. But he thinks, I will throw a religious festival for the um, for Neptune, the equestrian Neptune god, and I'll invite everybody. So they promote it heavily. It's on their Twitter, it's on their Facebook, it's on their Snapchat. Everybody's finding out about this. And whilst people don't want to marry Romans, they're quite happy to, you know, come check things out, look at the games. And so a lot of people turn up. And obviously they're from areas that are fairly close to Rome for the main part. Now, once the games begin, it becomes a bit like a very sick version of the sting. So Romulus has arranged with some of the young men in Rome that on a prearranged signal, once everyone's distracted by the games, they should immediately start seizing as many maidens as they can. Oh, oh, I don't like where this is going. No, no. This is infamously known in popular culture as the rape of the Sabines. Now, it's obviously a pretty chaotic scene, and there are different accounts about how exactly this went down. Like maybe they were deliberately targeting women who are particularly attractive and the most attractive was going to go to the highest ranking Romans and there's all this sort of talk. But certainly it would have been very chaotic and obviously everyone's caught very off guard. So it's a mad scene. Parents are fleeing, you know, women are being dragged off. What exactly happened to them afterwards is a little unclear but suffice it to say that they were upset they weren't happy with this situation they obviously knew what this probably meant for their future prospects now in some versions Romulus ordered that they be untouched for a night and then he spoke to them the next day when they were sort of brought brought before him certainly what you get the sense of is that Romulus tries really hard to spin this situation so the women are upset angry despondent and he's like look guys, turn that frown upside down. I mean, think about it this way. You're going to be married. We're not just going to rape you and then toss you aside. We want to make you our wives. We want you to bear our children. I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> and on top of that, if you go into the marriage with a positive attitude, you're probably going to get more out of it than if you go in being a negative Nancy. <laughs> And this is when the husbands chime in and they start saying, oh, you know, babe, I just couldn't control myself. You're just so beautiful. And I particularly love the fact that one of the sources says that was enough to win the women over. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah. You know, women can't resist a compliment. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So it seems that one way or another, the women are talked around to accepting this situation. And Romulus does point out as well that, you know, if your parents had just said yes to the dress, 
we wouldn't be in this situation in the first place. So really, it's your fault. Uh, <laughs> dude, no. Yeah, absolutely. So whatever happens, the women obviously sort of resign themselves to the situation. And let's face it, what choice do they really have? I mean, what are their prospects going to be after this in this sort of a world where chastity and virginity are so highly prized? So they accept their fate. Trouble is, their parents still aren't accepting what has happened, obviously. Not only have the Romans robbed them of their daughters, but they've also seriously violated the laws of hospitality. <laughs> you don't get to do this in a religious festival in the ancient world. No, 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 no. No, this is offensive to the gods. Absolutely. So they start to, they start talking to a very powerful man in the area, Sabine, by the name of Titus Tatius. And they say, hey, check out what the Romans did. Someone's got to check these guys. You know, we've got to put them in their place and sort this situation out. Trouble is, he is a bit slow to act. So there are three major cities that were also affected who decide, you know what, we're not going to wait for the Sabines to jump on this bandwagon. Let's just be our own allies and take action ourselves and sort this out. Now, I hardly need to say, Dr. G, Romulus is a pretty good king when it comes to being a general. And these guys also don't seem to organize themselves as effectively as they could have. And so one by one, Rome is kind of just knocking these guys back and basically beating them at their own game, conquering them. It's it's not good. <laughs> it's not good at all. Okay, so this is a, this is now a bit of a difficult situation, obviously, because you've now got Rome actually having conquered these neighboring cities. And this is where it gets interesting as far as the ladies are concerned. So a lot of the women who were captured, it seems like they're talking amongst themselves and they decide to go and talk to Romulus's wife, who is this woman called Hercilia. Now, Hercilia seems to have been one of the captured women herself, possibly quite an elite say by woman. She might actually have already even been married when she was captured and she either accidentally was taken or stayed behind because her daughter had been captured but however she ends up being Romulus's wife in this whole situation and so these women take their grievances to her and they say look we're really worried about obviously what's going to happen in this whole situation we're worried about our parents our friends our cities and she says yeah no I, I totally understand that and so she goes and speaks to Romulus about it and he says, look, you could actually make Rome a lot stronger if you're merciful in this situation. You know, grant them citizenship. Let's let's blend our cities together, you know, make yourself more powerful and also do something merciful and nice for these women and their families. And Romulus says, you know what? No problem, sugar. What? You got it. You got it. <laughs> Romulus finally doing something okay. <laughs> I know, I know. And so he does decide to show them mercy. And so these cities are turned into Roman colonies, which basically means that people from Rome can go and live there. But it also importantly means that a lot of the parents and relatives of these women can move to Rome and come and, you know, come and stay with their daughters or sisters or whoever was captured. So that's a pretty big thing. And so that sort of shows her having quite a lot of agency, even though Romulus still has the ultimate power. Hercilia seems to have, you know, some, some fairly strong agency in this sort of situation. Now, according to which source you read, she does potentially play a slightly different role. So there are reports that eventually the Sabines, once they see how easily Rome has conquered all these other places, they get their gear into action. They're like, okay, Clearly, we need to step up here. And so the Sabines do eventually come to blows with the Romans. And when they end up fighting in this battle, it's quite tight. You know, it goes against the Romans and then it goes for the Romans. And it's obviously going to be a close run thing. And there are accounts that it's at this moment in a battle that the Sabine women, feeling guilty because they feel like they are to blame for this situation, throw themselves in between the Romans and the Sabines and say, please don't do this. You know, we don't want to be orphans. We don't want to be widows. Can you please just you know, put the weapons down? And can't we all just get along? And, you know, their appearance, their wild appearance, the grief is so apparent that the men agree to put the weapons down. And this ends up leading to negotiations. It ends up meaning that Romulus will rule alongside Titus Tatius as co-kings. You know, it's a really interesting thing that these women bring about. In some accounts, Hercilia is actually sent along with some other women to go and negotiate in a slightly less frenetic ma manner, like not so much in the middle of battle. They actually go and speak to them beforehand as well. But either way, the Sabine women and Hercilia in particular 
are instrumental in bringing about this resolution in this war between Rome and the Sabines and the blending of their two cultures. This is a, an incredible story, I think, because it places women as both position in a position of agency. There are things that they are capable of doing and influencing. And it also emphasizes just how much that agency is tamped down upon by patriarchal ideas that are sort of embedded in this cultural structure that's part of Rome, but is also part of broader Italic culture in this period. So it's kind of like that investment in chastity that has meant that these women know that they can't leave Rome now that they've been captured, um, places them in a, in a position where their lives are completely altered and the lives, the political lives of every family that they're connected with is also altered because marriage is one of these ways in which you broker deals with other people. And all of a sudden Rome has changed that. And then for these women to come out in that moment, in this middle of the battle being like, this is literally all of our male relatives fighting each other for what? Um, it's like, it doesn't really matter who wins at this point. We will still be the loser. Absolutely. And, 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 they, and some of them have children by this stage. You know, that's how much time is meant to have gone past that they actually have children with their new husbands. Oh, okay. So this has been an ongoing <laughs> battle situation. Oh, my time goodness. Has time has passed. Yeah. Time has passed. Oh no. I'm so invested now that I have my child here. <laughs> well, and then certainly the, the upshot of this is that apparently the Sabine women are even more beloved by their husbands and their fathers because of the role that they played so much so that Romulus maybe even named some of the the curia after the Sabine women so they certainly obviously hold pride of place in terms of the role that they serve Rome and it's really interesting because Hercilia and the Sabine women what they're doing here is they're actually really stepping out of what is considered acceptable for a woman in Roman culture so they're they're being courageous they're being brave they're taking action you know they're stepping into a totally masculine sphere by stepping onto the battlefield if that is in fact what they did and that ends up leading to real benefits for the Roman state because it's of course it's like that masculine behavior but just as a side note in the course of this conflict between the Sabines and the Romans that we do also have this story of Tarpeia I won't go into all the details but suffice it to say whilst there may be a different explanation for her actions she's often known as someone who betrayed the Romans by allowing the Sabines to sneak in and capture this particularly important citadel and the reason why she did that was either because she fell in love with like Titus Tatius or was attracted to him, or she apparently wanted some jewelry that the Sabines were wearing. And that scene is being very feminine, you know, to, to do something like that. And also to then take that step of betraying your countrymen in order to gain those things. So her very feminine actions, if we look at that version of things can be seen to lead to disaster for Rome potentially even though it doesn't, mm. doesn't end up that way, but it didn't look good for a while. Yeah, I know. Fair enough. Um, that's some fascinating stuff coming through in Romulus's life and rule. And to switch now to think about um, the second king of Rome. Yes. So Romulus sort of disappears in a thunderstorm uh, <laughs> awkwardly. Like and <laughs> was it assassination or was he becoming a god? Uh, nobody knows. Um, they decided he was becoming a god. Cute. Maybe not true. Um, and then they have to search around for a new king. So despite the fact that Romulus and Hercilia are married, it's not at all clear that hereditary kingship is something that the Romans are going to do. And even if there are children involved from that union, it doesn't seem to be the case that that's the way the Romans are going to go. So they have a period where they're looking around for a new king. And they're like, who could it be? <laughs> Who's fit to rule this, this mob? Um, and they eventually settle upon a, uh, I would say young, but that's only because I'm getting old now, uh, a young 39-year-old uh, from Cures, the capital of the Sabine territory, known as Numa Pompilius. And he's almost like chalk and cheese from Romulus. Romulus is this hulking sort of warrior, warlike figure that everyone's like, did you know he murdered his own brother? <laughs> um, that guy. To Numa, who's known for being a bit of a philosopher, um, coming out with wise statements and very happily married to Tartia. 
uh, the daughter of Titus Tatius. I was going to say, the name gave it away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so part of the reason that he might have been selected to become king in the first place is because he does have this connection to the Sabine leadership mm. through that marriage. And he agrees reluctantly uh, to come to Rome and to be king. He doesn't really want to do it, which, of course, makes everybody want him to do it more. And he kind of fits into this model of the philosopher king, which is something that the ancient Greeks and then the ancient Romans really quite enjoy as a concept, um, philosophically, literarily. And Numa comes and he brings Tartia and they live in Rome and he rules there. And he's all about rules. He's like, this place is a bit lawless and everybody's a bit out of control. Um, he's like, we need to institute some proper um, connections with the gods. We need to observe some important rituals. He spends a lot of time building up the religious side of ancient Rome. That's the thing he's credited for the most. Right. Unfortunately, Tartia dies huh. um, after they've moved to Rome and she seemed quite happy there, but she leaves us, departs us, sadly. Um, <laughs> but don't worry, he's not at a loss for making friends. Um, <laughs> he does start to develop some rumours, and we're not sure whether the source of this is Numa himself, other people, or whether this is just a convenient cover for something else. Uh, but he starts spending some time in the local forests, and people are like, well, that's an odd thing to do. Who just wanders around in the forest all the time? And he comes back and he's like, well, I'm consulting with a goddess. And everyone's like, you what now? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, no, no, I, I've, got a, I've got a good friend. Uh, her name's Ajuria. Um, she lives in the forest. Um, she's divine. Um, and we have these great conversations. And, you know, I just, I, I really vibe with her. And I think, you know, some things around here have got to change. Um, and... Basically, a lot of our sources, uh, Plutarch sort of runs through this story um, in some detail. They sort of dismiss it as being impossible. They're like, there's no way there was a goddess in the forest um, that he's <laughs> having conversations with. And moreover, why would a goddess want to hang out with him anyway? And Plutarch immediately takes it into like sex. He was like, no goddess is ever going to want to have sex with a mortal man. It's just, it'd just be gross for them. Um, <laughs> It's not something gods want to do. And it's like, no offense, huh? Numa, but she's like totally out of your league. <laughs> and I'm like, Plutarch, did you not hear about what happened to Rhea Sylvia and Mars? I'm like, this is <laughs> like the parallels. Different, clearly. I mean, she's a she's a mortal woman. The, the gods often target mortal women. It doesn't often happen the other way around. <laughs> yeah, apparently so. And so whether it's the convenience of having a narrative that sort of backs up his agenda politically because he's not a warrior king like Romulus, he's very much pushing a more legal agenda, um, having something on his side like a goddess is really useful. It gives a sense of legitimacy to what he's trying to do. And I, I can accept that reading. That's a very rational reading coming from our ancient sources. But I also want to kind of believe that Numa has some advisors that he goes and meets up with in the forest. Um, he's coming from Sabine territory. Sabines are not necessarily um, overlapping with Etruscans, but we can't sort of forget that we're all we're dealing with the same sort of region, this north region and the hills and things like this. And the Etruscans seem to have a different mode of operating when it comes to like the relationships between men and women. As far as we can tell, the evidence is scant. Um, so I'm not going to put this out here as the big theory about what's going on. But the idea that Numa might be open to consulting with women and that women might be considered wise in other contexts outside of the Roman patriarchal system is not so unlikely to me. That seems to be something that could be possible. That is and interesting. For, <laughs> it is. And, and yeah, and so... I think that sort of sums up a little bit of what's going on in Numa's reign. Definitely. Oh, look, I would love to be able to tell you next all about Tullus Hostilius because he's a total contrast to Numa. But sadly, we don't really have time to go into Tullus Hostilius's reign or Ancus Marcius, who are the two kings that follow Numa. Suffice it to say, there were women in their lives and they both actually have interesting connections to 
previous women who have been involved in the in the regal period. So, for example, Hercilia seems to be descended from Hercilia, so Romulus is right, wife, and Ancus Marcus, he seems to be descended from Numa's daughter. So there are some interesting familial connections there, but we won't go into the women of their reign too much, I think. I would instead love for you to tell me about one of the most famous women of this period, and that is Tanaquil. Ah, Tanaquil is amazing. Thank you. I will take the floor. Um, <laughs> so we get some fascinating recounts of what is happening with Tanaquil, which means that we're sort of we're jumping into the rule of the fifth king, Lucius Tarquinius Priscus. Now he doesn't start off with that name. Uh, he starts off with a different name. He's not a Roman, um, <gasps> but <gasps> just to wait. <laughs> Uh, he is an Etruscan and his name, his real name is Lucamo. And he and his brother both come from an okay family, um, but Lucamo doesn't really inherit very much. Uh, most of things get to go to his brother, Egerius, and so he's not super happy about that. The one thing that's working in Lucamo's favour, though, is that he's already married to a pretty amazing woman, Tanaquil. And she comes from a noble Etruscan family. So these two are living together in the Etruscan city of Tarquinii. And, you know, things have unfolded in terms of the family and it's not going that well in terms of their prospects. But Tanaquil is like a go-getter. And I like to think of these two as a bit like the Macbeth and the Lady Macbeth of their times. They're like ambitious and they're powerful and they know what they want and they're going to go for it head on. And they do. And she's like, Lucamo, this place, we're never going to make it here. Nobody cares enough. You've seen how your family treats you, preferencing your brother over you. Let's get out of here. We need to move somewhere where there's a, it's a land of opportunity, where we can really embrace our ambitions. And he's like, what are you suggesting? And she's like, let's move to Rome. He's like, ooh. Land of opportunity. <laughs> land of opportunity. Yeah, because Rome has this reputation for bringing people in and offering sanctuary. And so they're kind of like, it'd be a new start. It could be great. So they're like, all right. And they hitch all their stuff together and they're on their way. And they get to the Janiculum, which is a little hill that overlooks Rome on the other side of the river. They're very excited. And they're looking out and being like, just think of the possibilities. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there's an eagle. Uncanny. <laughs> Uncanny. Thank you. I, it's an amazing eagle sound effect if I do say so myself. This eagle swoops down and it's like, and it's sort of squawking the whole time and it picks up Lucamo's hat and grabs it and then flies back off with the hat in its, in its beak. And even though it's got its beak wrapped around the hat, it's still squawking. <laughs> <laughs> and then as they're watching it imagine the special effects to bring this shot together uh the cgi and uh the they come the, the eagle flies back down and places the hat back on lucamo's head and then flies off again dr g i think the eagle has landed <laughs> da, da, da. <laughs> it has well tanaquil sees this and she's like that that is a sign uh and she is from an Etruscan background, as we've noted, and she is versed and trained as the elite are in the Etruscan culture in being able to read signs and prodigies. And she's like, this is a sign that you are going to become the king. And he's like, whoa, no way, man. <laughs> Mind blown. And she's like, it will happen. Trust me. And indeed it does happen. So she is totally on the money with this. And because she's on the money with this kind of stuff, I think he's also very open to believing her when she interprets other signs as well, because this is not the only example. Oh, please tell me more. <laughs> yeah. So something strange does happen. So after he becomes king, Tanaquil, and he's now known as Lucius Tarquinius Priscus. He's changed his name. He's roamed it up. Yeah. Um, now they're living as royals. And one day, uh, one of their enslaved women comes to Tanaquil and she's like, you need to come and have a look at this fire in the other room. And Tanaquil's like, well, sure, honey, let's just take a look together. And they have a look and there is a 
phantom phallus oh in my the Lord. fire. <laughs> Nine one one, your penis is on fire. <laughs> it is so hot right now. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about you, but if I had seen that, I'd be like, I don't know what's going on here, but I think it's time to walk away. Yeah, not Tanaquil. Not Tanaquil. Not today, Satan. Not Mm-mm. today. <laughs> no, that is not happening. Um, she looks at this enslaved woman, and we have her name. Her name is Ocrisia. And she says to Ocrisia, you need to stay in this room with this phantom phallus, and we need to see what happens. I want oh, you to God. have your way with it, Okay. Slavery, this is a man. sign. Slavery. <laughs> yeah, look, you do not want to be an enslaved person in <laughs> ancient Rome. Um, now, Ocrisia is stuck in this room with this phantom phallus that came out of the fire. Uh, anyway, lo and behold, after the certain appropriate amount of time, Ocrisia gives birth to a child. Ah. Ah, Servius Tullius. Hmm. Mm. This child already has sort of got this sheen of an, of significance about him because of the way in which he's been born. Well, There's no yeah. way that a phantom phallus could be anything but divine. Yes, um, yes. Thank you, Dionysius of Halicarnassus, for that story. Yes. Um, but that's not the only sign that Tanaquil sees connected with this child. Mm-hmm. Um, one time, while the child is quite young and is asleep, uh, all of a sudden flames appear around his head and you might think well that makes sense because he was born of a phantom phallus out of a fire i mean the the boy is part flame let's face it (laughs) he's so hot right now (laughs) (laughs) Uh, people notice the child's asleep people in the household notice and tanacle is brought in and they're like what is going on here and she's like i sense another sign just, it's subtle. It's subtle, but it's there. Yeah. You know, most people would miss it, but not me. I, I see things. Um, and she goes straight to her husband and she's like, this child, if we didn't think this child was special before, believe me, this child is significant. We need yeah. to keep this child close. We need to look after this child and we need to raise him correctly because I think there are big things coming his way. <laughs> and Lucius is like, Sure, definitely, I'm on it. You made me king. We got here. You know, whatever you say goes, you know how to read the signs. And she does. But she also knows how to be political. Mm. And when the time comes that Lucius falls ill and and he is dead, let, let us make no mistake, our sources suggest that he is legitimately dead, she pretends that he is just unwell. She does the old closing the door, closing the door. Don't go in. He's not well. Speaking to Bernie's ancient Roman style. <laughs> it's a, it's don't look, don't, don't open the door. Only <laughs> I'll go in there. Um, while he's rotting away on the bed in the room, she comes up to Servius Tullius and she's like, you need to get your act together. This is the time to move. You need to gather the support you need because you need to be the next king. I've seen the signs. Yeah. And he's like, Bleh. And, but he's pretty persuaded by that as well. And he does it, you know, who wouldn't want to be ambitious to be a king when you're born into slavery and you've got all of a sudden this opportunity where the queen is essentially saying to you, oh no, you need to be the next guy. Yeah. Uh, None of the children will do. It needs to be you. Um, He's like, okay, all right. Uh, He does what he's asked to do and organizes things. And once he's rallied the sort of necessary amount of support to sort of get him across the line, she reveals that oh no my husband he's dead (laughs) (laughs) i'm hoping she like shrouded the body before she's done that because there would be no way to not notice that he'd been dead for quite some time but anyway that is kind of like her political sort of vibe coming through and it's really fascinating how this sort of spreads out into later source material as well because we do get some evidence from pliny Um, referring to a passage from Varro, who's talking about the way that her distaff and her weaving tools are still preserved in the Temple of Sanctus. And actually a garment that she wove for Servius Tullius is on display at the Shrine of Fortuna some 500, 600 years later, it still survives, which I think is just an amazing story. So she's got this 
both this idea of being able to see things and interpret signs, but she's also a political agent and she clearly invests a lot of time supporting Servius Tullius' kingship and sort of making it work in terms of making him the clothes that would allow him to look the part and things like that. Well, that is quite the story. But enough of this spin doctor that you call Tanaquil. It is time to speed ahead to the end of the reign of Servius Tullius. So Tanaquil obviously did a pretty good job and she was not wrong. This guy becomes a really popular king, particularly it seems with the sort of common people. Okay, he's got that magic touch. Okay. However, Even though he's quite beloved and he's seen as being a very significant king who reigns for quite some time, there's no getting about the fact that the way he came to power was not normal and it did not follow procedure. So he is a usurper. He is. There's just no way around that. Now, this doesn't really catch up with him until late in his reign, but boy, does it catch up with him. (laughs) So we're late in the reign of Servius Tullius. Now, around this time, one of Tarquinius's apparently sons, and yes, there are some mathematical gymnastics around this. I'm not going to go into it. There's a lot of academia around it that you can read if you would like. But supposedly, this is either a son or a grandson of Tarquinius Priscus, right? He is growing up and he's starting to feel like he was chipped. He was robbed, okay? He should have a more important position in the society than this slave who is king. So there's a bit of rivalry going on between Servius Tullius and this Tarquin. Now, this is complicated by the ladies in the situation. So it turns out that Tarquinius Priscus had these two sons, okay? One is one I'm just going to call Tarquinius and the other one I'll call Aaron's, just so you can tell them apart. Now, Servius Tullius himself ends up having two daughters by Tarquinia. And yes, that was a marriage arranged for him by Tarquinius Priscus. You can tell by the unimaginative names. (laughs) Okay, and so, of course, both of his daughters are called Tullia. Hey, so just again to tell them apart, I'm going to call them T1 and T2. (laughs) Okay, so each of these daughters married to one of the Tarquins, to Aaron's and to Tarquinius. Now, as it would happen, between the sisters, one of them is really driven, ambitious. She's a go-getter. I mean, she's actually portrayed as being quite evil, but yeah, she's definitely ambitious and driven. The other one is a very traditional, modest, you know, retiring type. Now, as it so happens, Dr. G, wouldn't you know, the Tarquin boys are the same. One of them is very moderate, very prudent, you know, really quite chill. The other one, this is the one that's causing the problems. He is the ambitious, the troublemaker, that one, okay? Now, this is where it becomes a little bit like a sitcom. Wouldn't you know it, the shy daughter, T2, gets married to the hothead Tarquin and vice versa. Um, Oh, no. (laughs) Hilarity ensues. (laughs) So what ends up happening is T1, the ambitious go-getter kind of woman, She's really unhappy in her marriage, and she also just hates her sister. She just thinks, she's like, ah, you're pathetic. You've got this amazing husband who's out there clearly dying to aim for the throne, and what are you doing? Nothing. Nothing. You just sit there. You don't promote his career. You don't drive him to do better. I could take him all the way to the top. Ding. My <laughs> old moment. <laughs> wait so, a minute yeah these, these two very driven people are driven right into each other's arms as it would turn out they get serious hots for each other and so in order to make this little dream come true they decide to murder their spouses oh oh okay so they <laughs> That's do cool. they do and this of course frees them up to be together so they end up getting married maybe with Servius Tullius's very reluctant permission maybe not it's a bit unclear So as soon as they get married, of course, T1 is wasting no time. She is at Tarquinius to aim for the throne, to do something about it, to make something of himself. You know, he's got the goods. He's just got to use them. And it's really interesting, the language that is used in the sources. It very much positions her like a disease, a disease that spreads throughout his soul and infects him with this ambition and this desire and this hatred and this wickedness. So eventually he is indeed driven to do something about it. Now, as I said before, Servius Tullius seems to be perhaps by this stage more popular with the common people than he is with perhaps a lot of the patricians who are 
more or less a kind of upper class important people in Roman society at this point in time. And so it seems that Tarquinius is probably gathering most of his support from these people who have been turned off by some of the decisions that Servius Tullius has made that have benefited the poor people. So he does manage to get some support together. And he he waits and he finally seizes his moment and he rocks up with an armed following in the forum and he's like, I am king, attend me. And he sits in the royal chair and people are, you know, elder senate summoned to gather around him and hear what he has to say. And when Servius Tullius rocks up and is like, uh, knock, knock, who's there? That's right, the actual king. He, he resorts to physical violence. It ends up escalating to a point where Tarquinius actually picks him up carries him out of the Senate house and throws him down the stairs. And so he, Servius Tullius is an old man. He can't really take this sort of treatment. He's obviously bruised. He's beaten. But Tarquinius is no fool. He sends a couple of assassins after him to finish the job. So it's a total coup. He is completely taken over from Servius Tullius. And he feels like he has the right to do that because of his connections to previous kings and also Servius Tullius's background and all of that kind of stuff. Now, the interesting thing about it is apparently it was T1 that told him to make sure he had some assassins sent after Servius Tullius, her own dad. Tulia, right at the center of the plot. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so when she hears what's happened, she gets into her carriage, she goes to the forum. She's the first person apparently to hail her husband as the new king of Rome. And he's like, yeah, 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 love you too. Now get out of here. And so she heads home because it's obviously quite chaotic in that area, I would imagine at this point in time. On her way home, this is probably the worst part of her story. She's going down this little street and her driver suddenly stops. And he says, hey, isn't that your dad's dead body just lying in the street there? And she's like, drive. He's like, what? I said, drive. (laughs) And so they run over her father's dead body. And she ends up coming back home with the blood of her father on her carriage. Oh, my God. I know. That is is intense. It is intense. Intense. Now, suffice it to say, you'll be pleased to hear that eventually this couple do get their just desserts, but it does <laughs> take some time. So Tarquinius becomes this king who we know as Tarquinius Superbus, in other words, like Tarquin the Proud. So no surprises here. He's pretty brutal. He's pretty ruthless. He's obviously pretty arrogant. But he's not entirely unsuccessful in doing the kinds of things that a king should do in terms of maintaining his power. So he ends up ruling for a number of decades with T1 right by his side. Mm -hmm. But he has obviously ruffled a lot of feathers because of the kind of person that he is. Evil. (laughs) Yeah. So after some time, after some time, there's a campaign going on under his rule against this place called Ardea. Now, Unfortunately, the Romans haven't been able to just take it by storm. It's turned out to be this whole siege situation, okay? So that means that they're basically trying to starve people out of the city. So that means a lot of sitting around and waiting, pretty boring stuff. Now, some of the people who are involved are of quite high rank, and so it turns out that there are some royal princes, so some children of T1 and Tarquinius Superbus here. And so they decide to throw a little wine party, and they invite some of their relatives along, you know, some of their other high-ranking men, and one of them is a guy called Colatinus. Now, as they're drinking their wine, and I should say, this is this is from Livy, this is just the version that I like the best. Dionysius' version is a little bit different, but I like this one. They're sitting around drinking their wine and, you know, they're getting a little, little drunker and the argument starts to get a little bit heated because they bring up the subject of wives, about whose wife is the best. And so they're all trying to shout over each other, no, my wife is the best, no, my wife is the best. Finally, they decide, you know what, there's nothing really happening here. This is a siege why don't we just sneak off and spy on our wives? And that will settle this debate once and for all. So I love this scene from Libby because it means you've got a whole bunch of elite drunken Romans going, shh, 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 shush, shush, shush. They sneak up and one by one they spy on their wives. And wouldn't you know it, the women are completely misbehaving. So they're doing the kinds of thing that only really men should have the privilege to do. You know, they're having banquets with lots of friends. They're drinking wine. It's a real no-no for the Roman ladies. And they're having a great time. Until, of course, they get to the last house. And this is the house of Colatinus. 
Now, Lucretia is his wife and she is sitting there by candlelight, spinning away, working that wool with her slaves around her. So she's, you know, monitoring the household and everyone is like, well, yeah, okay, Lucretia, hands down, wins the wife competition. Great. Let's all go back to the camp. <laughs> now, unfortunately, I guess this game is over now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Unfortunately, amongst that little gang who was spying on the wives is one of the king's sons, the very unfortunately named from the point of view of someone who speaks English, Sextus Tarquinius. Now, Sextus Tarquinius, I think, has a bit of a librarian fantasy going on in that Lucretia is just so beautiful and so good that he feels like he must possess her and ruin her. Yeah. Now, because there is that family connection between them, he is able to come back a few days later and just expect to be put up by her because he is he's family. And so she's, of course, hostess with the mostess. She, you know, serves him dinner. She puts him up for the night. No problem. No questions asked. That's totally normal in the Roman world. He then waits until it's very late at night and everyone in the household is asleep. And then he sneaks into Lucretia's bedroom with a sword. And he says to her, if you make a noise or if you tell anyone anything, I will kill you. Now, Lucretia, Lucretia is a virtuous lady. She's not going to put up with this. And she, she just says, um, no, no, I don't agree to that. I will not sleep with anyone who is not my husband. That's the deal. And he says, all right, all right. Uh, I do find you very attractive. You are so beautiful. <laughs> she is still <laughs> not impressed. <laughs> And does not want to doesn't want to give in so she's she's acting in a way that's very uncharacteristically female as far as a stereotype of a roman woman goes in a man's mind in this time period and that she's being very strong she's not giving in to any of these compliments flattery will get you nowhere sextus then he says how about this if if you make a sound or you say anything i will kill one of your male slaves i will kill you and I will put your bodies in bed together and claim that I found you having sex with a male slave. And for so many reasons, for class reasons, for gender expectation reasons, everyone's going to be completely disgusted by your behavior and think I am a champion because I was just looking out for the family honor. And you will go down in history as someone who is a disgrace, if we even remember you at all. And Lucretia realizes that she has no option here. She does not want to be disgraced. She doesn't want to tarnish the reputation of her men because, of course, the reputation of a woman in the Roman world, it, it really matters as far as the reputation of their men folk goes as well. You know, So she, she realizes she has no choice, so she submits. He gets up the next day. He obviously leaves. Once he's gone, she gets up, she gets dressed, and she sends for her men folks, so her father, her husband, and also like a, a trusted friend of theirs who also happens to be connected to the royal family, as it would turn out. She didn't request him, but that's just who came along. When they arrive, she tells them exactly what has happened. She's obviously absolutely outraged that her honour has been abused. And she knows that she didn't ask for it. She knows she didn't deserve it, but she's still still this happened to her and so she says to them i want you all to promise that you're going to avenge me this cannot you know this cannot be allowed this is not in any way fair or just this just shouldn't happen and they're all like yeah of course we will do something about this this is not okay she then pulls out a dagger which she had hidden in her clothing and they're like whoa 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 now, what are you doing lady back, back up back up back up <laughs> And this is really interesting because in spite of the fact that the Romans do have these very high expectations of women's sexual behavior, they, in Livy's account, in any way, they do actually make a distinction between her having a guilty mind and a guilty body. They're like, your mind is innocent. You didn't consent to this. You didn't invite it. This is just something that happened to your body. So whilst your body, yes, might have been violated, your mind has not been. You're still fine. You're still pure. You're still, you can still consider yourself to be okay here. And she's like, no, I cannot. I absolutely never want any other woman to use me as some excuse or example for their unchaste behavior or their unfaithfulness. And therefore I have to die. And so she stabs herself, commits oh, suicide goodness. in front of them. Yeah. Pretty heavy moment. And obviously the father and the husband just go to pieces. They are absolutely distraught because she's the best. She is, you know, amazing. Brutus, 
luckily had, was there as well. Now, Brutus has been pretending to be stupid for most of his life, hence the name Brutus. He's been doing that because it seems that Tarquinius targeted some of his family members when he first came to power and maybe erased some of them, as in <laughs> took their lives. And so he doesn't want to attract any attention from Tarquinius as being like a potential rival for the throne, what with his connections to the family or anything and so he's been playing dumb his whole life but now he's like this is the moment this is the moment to cast it all off and to reveal who I really am a political genius <laughs> and so he takes a bloody dagger from Lucretia's hand and he swears that he will not only seek vengeance for her but that he will banish the kings he will get rid of them he will put an end to tyranny then and there. And he even says to the husband and father, stop crying, guys. This is not helpful right now. You need to get it together because we need to take some action. And so they end up taking Lucretia's body out in public. They really whip up the crowds and everybody starts complaining about all the many things that Tarquinius Superbus and his family have done wrong because they're tyrants. They're not good leaders as far as these people are concerned. And what ends up happening is they do end up abolishing the monarchy, kicking the kings out. So Tullia and Tarquinius kicked out of their palace, yeah, sent packing, okay? And this is also a moment for the Romans because they swear they're never going to have kings again. So this is it. This is the end of the regal period, and it really comes down partly to Lucretia's role in these events. Yeah, this is... Uh... It's, it's almost like I'm at a loss for words because it is incredible just how interwoven into the political fabric women like Lucretia, Tanaquil, uh, really are in terms of the effect that they have. And we get this sense through this whole period that there are moments of, of agency where women make decisions, make choices for themselves that have huge consequences for the way that the Romans understand themselves. And then there are the moments where because of the patriarchal nature of their society and the sorts of values that are really embodied by Romanness in the early period, but also potentially being retrojected back into this early period by our sources, um, that women are really constrained in what is possible for them to do. And so there's this real tension, but we get some incredible characters coming through when we start to look at this early period. So thank you so much for sharing these stories. Oh, no, thank you. I think, I think you're right. I think it absolutely is fascinating that when you look, women are there in all these very crucial stories. And whilst you can definitely tell that some of them, floating phallus in a fire, have these mythological elements the fact that the Romans choose to preserve these stories and keep telling them, it does say something about the fact that they're they're willing to have women be a part of these stories. They see women as playing a role in these stories. And it's really interesting as well that they often do pop up in these moments of crisis or change. And certainly, obviously, the, the monarchic period is seen as this period where gradually Rome is taking on the character that people will later know. You know, each king is contributing something to build Rome into the Rome that later on will obviously become this really important place and really significant for the people that live there. But the fact that the women are a part of that story, I think is, is really fascinating. You know, they're not erased from the history. They're certainly, they're certainly put in there. They are a part of it and they help to, to drive, to drive events in really important ways. And they certainly seem to be game changers in some ways. Yeah, and it's hugely pivotal at certain moments as well. A lot hinges on the way that they act and the decisions that they make. So yeah, it has been a huge pleasure uh, to chat about these early women. The pleasure is all mine, Dr. G, as always. <laughs> I think I'll jump in now. Um, it's my great pleasure to offer the vote of thanks tonight on behalf of the Australasian Women in Ancient World Studies and everyone who's attended this evening. Um, I'd like to expend, uh, extend special thanks to Dr. Fiona Radford and Dr. Peter Greenfield, known to their avid podcast listeners and Twitter followers as the partial historians for their insightful and engaging talk this evening. I think I can confidently speak um, for everyone here when I say that your enthusiasm for all things Roman is infectious. And we thank you for sharing your expertise about the women of early Rome with us this evening. Um, 
it's sorry it's been an incredible experience learning more about the women in Rome before Lucretia and of course revisiting the story of Lucretia herself. Um, I'd also like to extend uh, thanks to Dr Craig Barker, Candace Richards and the team at the Chow Chak Wing Museum for organising this event and for ensuring that it ran so smoothly. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us and we're really, really sorry about the video, everybody. Um, I suppose I should look like this or you won't recognise me. <laughs> I thought that it was the best freeze frame I've ever seen. I was thoroughly... I look like one of those celebrity photos where you've turned the smile upside down. <laughs> I think it captures a real disdain for some of the behaviour that we see the Romans engaging with. So it captured the moment for me really precisely. Absolutely. Every time I looked up at a certain point in the story, I was like, actually, this is the right expression. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Ron. We actually did that because we were trying to avoid technological glitches. Uh, we have we will learn from history and next time we will not pre-record. <laughs> we are always at the mercy of the internet gods. And as everybody I think in the audience is very aware, um, we're all working from home at the moment here in Sydney. Um, it's been a long time working at home for some of us. Uh, and so we are dependent on our own personal internet every day. So we apologize, uh, but it was such an entertaining and fabulous uh, kind of whirlwind of so many women. And I know that you didn't get to tell all of the female women's stories that you really wanted to. Um, and I hope that we can hear some more later. Um, but we'll jump straight into the Q&A. As I've said in the chat a couple of times now, guys, make sure if you have questions, put them in the Q&A because I will definitely be able to read them there. The chat is where you can put all your congratulations uh, because there's so much coming in. So thank you so much. Uh, we had a really early question on actually just as you got started uh, from one of our attendees who wanted to know, um, was the earliest piece of writing by a woman found at Vindolanda? Um, they I recall something about a birthday invitation. Uh, for a friend. Yeah, I believe so. Yes, I think there was a, a birthday invitation from one woman to another talking about how, how much she would love for her, um, I think it was her friend, I, I can't remember if it was a friend or a sister, to come and attend her birthday party. Uh, and that was, you know, one of the, one of the rare and beautiful finds that have been found along, along all those Hadrian Wall um, forts, because of course the men who fought there did live there as well and, and had, had women alongside them. Oh, it's such a beautiful site. There's so much richness that comes out from that one. Um, and then we'll go straight on to the next question from Mary. Uh, so which sources discuss Brutus playing stupid? Uh, and also why was the connection to his name? <laughs> Well, yeah, there, there, there are a lot of stories that I wish we could have talked about with Brutus and, and playing stupid, but essentially the stories that we get from the ancient sources, um, in, a, in a few of them, um, my favourite one's always from Livy. I, I'm a Livy girl, as our listeners will know. Um, basically, when uh, Tarquin comes to power, because he is quite a ruthless, tyrannical sort of character, he seems to have bumped off some of Brutus's male relatives. And so Brutus realizes he has to play dumb. And there are a number of amusing stories about Brutus doing this. Like for example, when some of Tarquin's, uh, um, so I should say Superbus's, sorry, sons go to the Delphic Oracle for unrelated reasons. They ask about the succession plans and they're given, of course, this really cryptic response from the Delphic Oracle, which is, you know, half of the course. Um, and it's a, it basically says that whoever, whichever one of you, you know, there are a number of sons. Whichever one of you is the first to kiss his mother upon returning home, you will be the next king of Rome. And they're all trying to figure it out. And, you know, all, all these amusing stories about how they figure out they're all kiss their mother at exactly the same time when they get back. But Brutus is the one who figures out the real meaning. And so even though he's playing dumb and, you know, like falling over and that sort of thing, when they get back to Italy, he makes sure he falls over and kisses the ground. And <laughs> so he's playing stupid, but he's really very clever. Oh, I love it. And yes, Brutus, <laughs> so much joy. And I really am excited about uh, basically hearing all of your dedicated podcasts on every aspect of the stories that you've said. <laughs> we so do like every aspect. <laughs> I feel like we'll have to go back and revisit some of our earlier episodes because there's a lot more detail, I think, that we could build mm -hmm. in, actually. <laughs> you um, astound me, Dr. G. <laughs> <laughs> the next question comes from Madeline saying it's essentially impossible to tell the story of earlier Rome without women, uh, be it later in the Republican, in Republican Rome, the story can be told quite easily with the women erased. Um, and do you think there's a reason for this? 
Yes, yes. We've talked about this, actually, because we were thinking that, like, there are moments where the politics becomes structured in such a way that it's not dependent on um, women's presence necessarily so when we start with early rome we've got this monarchical structure and that's essentially a family structure even if it's not a hereditary monarchy you've got to produce some children they're probably going to be quite important women sort of are holding court with men and things like this and we sort of start to see some of that creep back in when we head into the augustan prince of it and that you've got this sort of explosion of women in a more public way, all of a sudden under Augustus. And then that continues throughout the imperial period. And yet a republic is sort of, it's a complicated, Rome's complicated, obviously, uh, but it's complicated by the fact that like there's a Senate, which is all dudes, and then there's magistracies, which are all men. And the idea is that all rotates really seamlessly. And the connections with other men really matter. And your connections with women uh, are sort of happening in the background with those strategic marriages but they're not the force that is driving the power structures in some respects. So there's a sense in which they can recede a little bit into the background and be raised as it were. Wonderful. And I, I, that's such a fabulous, it's, it's such an interesting analogy as well, because when you were talking um, a little bit, what popped into my mind is that women really do come to the forefront in moments of crisis and change in a way that suggests they're always there we just don't tell them until there's a moment of crisis or change and then we have to pin it on a woman. And I think it's such an interesting, interesting, I love the, yeah, there's so much going on. Sorry. Well, we probably should point out here, that we, we can't take credit for that entirely, <laughs> obviously. Um, that was something that we read in the recent and brilliant book by uh, Peter Keegan. And so he, he, that's something that he constantly highlights as he goes through and looks at all the women in Livy's account. But yeah, I thought it was a really fascinating theory when I read about it. And it was just something I wanted to, to focus on in this talk tonight. Fabulous. And we'll jump now to Melinda's question, because she asked, where would you suggest to start with reading more about these early women? So... Well, Peter Keegan's book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, look, Peter Keegan has just published this great book uh, called Livy's Women, which obviously does have a focus on Livy as a source. It is quite an academic text, so it depends on where you, you know, where you want to jump in, if you want to jump in with the academia or whether you want to start off with something a little bit lighter, because there are some um, interesting source collections which have some of the highlight moments. So, you know, excerpts from Livy and Dionysius about Lucretia and those sorts of people. So you can get those sort of lighter versions, which have a little bit of commentary as well. So it kind of depends, I suppose, where you want to start. And I will point out that um, Fiona and Peter have fabulously put together that bibliography document for you. So um, Keegan's book is definitely on that list. Um, and if you don't have it, I know there's a couple of messages in the chat. If for some reason you couldn't get it from the chat or you can't download it, you need to email us. If you just email CCWM, you'll find an email on the website. We can send it off to you. That's not a problem. So just yeah, we'll, we'll put it on our website too. So. Exactly. So <laughs> there'll be lots of places to grab it. Great. I'd say uh, that there's, like there is an accessible, like uh, it is academic, but still probably a little bit more accessible would be Tim Cornell's book, um, The Beginnings of Rome. Italy yeah. and Rome from the Bronze Age to the Punic Wars and this is sort of like a broad history so it's not just focused on the women but it's definitely quite readable and engaging so that would be one I would recommend as well. Um, well I've got a question from Anonymous is that how do you think the women's role in politics has changed or not today in comparison with ancient Rome? Mm. I think you can still see the lingerings of patriarchal thinking in the way that political structures operate, even if we're thinking about just the Australian context um, and the sort of challenges that Julia Gillard faced as our first uh, female prime minister, I think gives us a bit of an insight into the ways in which um, women historically, and I think this is a legacy that comes out of this sort of Greek and Roman way of thinking, is that women should probably take a back seat and maybe be a little bit more in the private rather than in the public. And that is something that we're still navigating, I think, to getting better across time, I think, but still there's room to improve. I think there's also something to be said, something that I've become more and more aware of the more that I have taught Roman history is that 
whilst it is obviously important to consider gender, and obviously that's something that um, Dr. G and I really enjoy exploring, class is such a big issue and you, you can't you can't ignore that either. And I feel like that's obviously a huge part of modern day politics as well in terms of who has access to education, who has access to power, who is going to be listened to. I mean, these these days in certain countries, I think that your class is probably going to be a bigger barrier than your gender in some ways as well. And um, and certainly when you look back at the regal period of Rome, you can definitely see that the women we're talking about are 99 percent from the elite. Mm. And how those things compound upon each other as well it's just such a it is such a rich topic as well that i think a lot of scholars are starting to really explore in true depth now um there's so much really interesting scholarship that's been coming out in the last two years that really are looking at intersectionality when it comes to understanding the ancient world and the modern day so if you are interested in that there are lots of really great scholars and really great young scholars around that are, that are on this um, and i encourage you to find them um so the next question and we'll, and we'll wrap it up quite soon uh, but we do have a question from Marcus, who, who really enjoyed tonight's talk, um, and he says that a lot is written about pederasty in uh, Rome and ancient Greece, uh, and this seems to be a practice that's carried out by men. Um, and is there any literature to say, that indicates that there might be a similar relationship for women in ancient Rome? Mm, yeah, we kind of wish that we had stuff <laughs> like that, but it's almost like the Romans ignore women and their sexuality, except as mm. it relates to men. And so you get a lot of really interesting and salacious poetry where women feature quite heavily as uh, objects of desire and then are also vilified when they make decisions and have agency of their own and decide to go elsewhere. Um, so we know that the women are sort of uh, out in the world and doing things, um, but we're often constrained by the fact that a lot of our written sources are coming through that male lens. So we're really getting their perspective on it. And for them, it seems to be mostly about how they're relating with women, not how women might be relating in their own right. Yeah, I think uh, sex between women is probably about one of the most disgusting things I think that Roman men can think about from memory. So I, it's not something that they <laughs> have to, to focus on. <laughs> um, all right, we've got two more, three more questions in the chat that we'll whip through. Um, was there a female emperor? And if not, what about senators? <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only. <laughs> Not a female emperor, no, although there definitely were women who tried, such as my favourite, Agrippina the Younger. Yes, Agrippina. <laughs> and arguably we might think of Ella Gallibus as potentially straddling into that sphere as well. Um, there's certainly work to suggest that um, there's a fluidity of gender there in identity. So I think that's, that holds some really rich possibilities as well. Definitely. Um, from another anonymous attendee, um, are women being described as virtuous and brave, uh, written by the authors as if it was the exception, or is this a common attribute given to women? I really like that question. It is something I think that we noticed as we were compiling all these stories, because previously we've only talked about them as we went through the reigns of the kings, but putting them all together and also reading some of the scholarship around this, you do realise that when women are being described as being courageous in the sense that, you know, the Sabine women are courageous when they throw themselves into the battlefield, it, it is praise that they're kind of, they're kind of taking on a masculine virtue. It's not something that's seen as inherently, some, it's inherently something that women can have. Um, and so a typical female in terms of their behavior is a woman who kind of lets her emotions override everything else. So we didn't get to tell the story of Horatia, um, who is the sister of these three brothers who end up going off to fight some of Rome's enemies. And one of them comes back alive after having dispatched Rome's enemies. And she is just distraught. You know, she's crying all over the place because her fiance was one of the enemies that he killed and he kills her on the spot. And that's the kind of feminine weakness that the Romans expect because he's like, so perish every woman, you know, who can't think about the state above herself, can't think about her brother and her, her main family above, above her fiance. And so that's the kind of typical, I suppose, more feminine kind of emotional behavior that the Romans expect. They, they do understand that women can 
take on these these virtues and they are obviously Roman women and there's a lot to be said for being Roman whether you're a man or a woman but yeah definitely they are capable of it but it's seen as then sort of taking on something masculine in my point of view. Yeah it's tricky as well because for a lot of this history that we're looking at our sources are writing centuries after these events and they're coloured to a certain degree by the women's activity that is happening in their time period. And so predominantly our sources are from the Augustan period onwards, where we're dealing with an imperial idea and women are back in the public eye in a, in a big way. And so this means that they're kind of reading the women of early Rome through a lens of thinking about how they might reflect the morals of their period. And so the sorts of things that they might want to criticize obviously become things uh, that are happening in their time period that they're not so happy with. Um, yeah. And some of that sort of bravery and courage is okay to a certain extent, but they also don't want it to go too far. Um, so yeah, there's a real like, tension like a in one. our sources. <laughs> Yeah, so there's a, the sources are really, there's, there's a tension there between like what they think might be virtuous and then the sorts of the behaviours they're trying to explain or critique as well. Yeah, it's like, it's like there's a line where a woman is expected, if a Roman woman is expected to be tough in the same way that a Roman man can be tough, but in her own sphere, you know, in the private sphere where she's looking after her family and being loyal to her family and that kind of stuff. So she has her own sort of virtues um, like chastity and that kind of stuff, but they tend to be more confined to the private sphere when when they step out into these sort of um, occasional public things or, or when they show those other sorts of things, it, it becomes, yeah, it becomes different, I suppose. Wonderful. And I think that we're going to wrap it up there because it's just uh, past 8 p.m. now here in Sydney. Um, thank you both so much for joining us tonight at our uh, live online CCWM. <laughs> Um, and I can't wait to be able to do installment two of this live from the gallery, I hope. Um, and for everyone that's still with us, I think one of the best things about not only just your podcast, but this evening is that you demonstrate in so many ways how layered our hist how layered all of these histories are and the sources and how entwined they are, how you can poke a little teeny tiny hole in something and all of a sudden expose a fabulous Weekend at Bernie's style story <laughs> um, from, from these kind of ancient sources in a way that is really, really relevant to us today. It's really relevant when we think about gender and class, as you say, but it's just really interesting to see how you guys are able to really kind of pick apart all those layers and make it really accessible for us all. And, and I so appreciate that, um, as I'm sure many of us do. So, so thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks everyone for joining us online. Um, we've always got um, some more events coming up towards the end of the year. So check out our online, check out our website at CCWM. Um, but also if you still have any questions uh, for Fiona and Peter, please, I'm sure, uh, send them information on Twitter, uh, find them on social media and pose all of your questions there. They are so generous with their time and expertise and, and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> Night, everybody. Bye.